is it peaking in that thing? One, two, one. Well, y'all turned it down last night, so I thought it was peaking in that. One, two, three, one, two. Yeah, it does make it hard. I know that great acoustics in here, but it makes it hard when you feel like you don't even have any microphone. That's what it is. And see, they're so far behind me, they're hitting the wall. You can't put no house in it? Or does that does that mess up that sound? One, two, one, one, two. That's better. You, you ain't even got to get that hot. Okay. One, two, three, one, two. It does, don't it? Yeah, you, yeah we don't want that buzz. One, two, three, one, two. That's fine right there. That'll work. All right, we'll do uh, two seconds. You guys ready? I want to welcome you guys back again tonight uh, to our Go and Grow series on personal evangelism. Uh, just want to give a real big shout out to each one of you that have tuned in here, Witness Outreach Ministries. We sure appreciate you taking the time this evening to join us. Appreciate all the views yesterday, the comments. Uh, just appreciate everybody that has just supported us for uh, what we're doing here this week in revival. We have started a revival, started yesterday morning, going through Thursday night. It'll be 6 p.m. each night this week. And uh, I want to thank Pastor Brian and Sister Amy for the opportunity to get to come and stand in the pulpit tonight and just love on you guys and encourage you and strengthen you on the subject of personal evangelism. I want to start off tonight and uh, just dig right into this thing. I really don't think that this uh, a series needs, a, 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 I guess you would say, an, um, someone to get up here and, and give us an interlude to it. I believe it speaks for itself. For the fact that we've had over 600 views each service. So I uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to come in. And uh, so just get you a cup of coffee, a big old glass of sweet tea, a Dr. Pepper, a bottle of water, kick back, relax, and let the Lord just minister to your heart tonight. Amen. Let's start out tonight with a word of prayer and pray that your ears and your hearts are open for what God's about to say to you tonight. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to stand in this pulpit tonight and declare what you've placed in my heart. I thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl. I thank you for every leader in the church that is watching by live stream, whether it's a part of Witness Outreach Ministries or some other affiliation of some other church. I want to thank you tonight, God, that they've made it priority today to tune in tonight and be a part of what you're doing and what you're about to say. Now, God, I trust you, and I'm asking you to speak tonight very clear. Speak in a definitive fashion tonight, God, that would just stir our hearts, set our spirits on fire, and get our feet moving in the right direction. We thank you, God, Lord, that you're just amazing. David said, I will look under the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, builder and maker of heaven and earth. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you. And as the marquee sign says right out front, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. And we give you glory and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Continuing our theme, Restoring 2020 Vision. Tonight I want to continue capitalizing on the mandate of personal evangelism. That will not change this week. That's the purpose of why I'm here. That is the reason why I'm here is to expound each night on 2020 Vision, uh, personal evangelism. Our leadoff verse thus far in this revival has been Proverbs 11, verse 30, where it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. What is evangelism? As I've said before, I will repeat nightly, just in case we pick up some new eyes and new ears along the journey this week. We we'll everybody on the same page, and then we'll thrust forward. The meaning of evangelism is the vibrant verbal and visual declaration of the good news about Jesus Christ. And the purpose or the goal for evangelism is to convert the hearer to faith in Jesus Christ. 
I want you to lean in on this first comment tonight and listen closely to what I'm about to say. 1,836 people died as a result of Hurricane Katrina, which has been called the worst natural disaster to ever hit the American shores. However, every 19 minutes, that many souls perish without Christ. You know, the truth is natural disasters cannot be prevented. But because of Calvary, God's people can start helping prevent this continual spiritual disaster of souls dying without hope. I want to make a statement tonight, and I want you to listen closely. Evangelism, in my opinion, not just because I've been an evangelist for 25 years, because I am not talking this week about you doing what I'm doing. Many of you are not preachers. I would say probably three-quarters of those listening probably are not called to a pulpit ministry. And maybe some of you are not even called in leadership in the church, being that you're on the platform or you're in some administrative office in the church. So I can't come this week trying to be adamant about the fact getting you to do what I'm doing. So when I'm speaking about evangelism, I'm not talking about the office of the full-time evangelist. I am talking about the fact, amen, of you doing your part, staying in your lane to convert as many uh, hearers to faith in Jesus Christ as you possibly can. Evangelism, in my opinion, is the most crucial and necessary ministry within any church, hands down. Now, I would say three months ago, that would be up for debate. Many would probably prefer to debate me three months ago. But today, there's no debate about it. Because the church has been considered to be non-essential, meaning insignificant, of no importance, while the liquor store and abortion clinic is. So based on that and that alone, based on the fact that the Son of Man come to seek and to save that which is lost, based on the fact that the purpose why Jesus died on a cross and shed his blood innocently was to come to a landfill called earth looking for a piece of garbage such as I. It's always been about evangelism. It's always been about outreach. It's the heartbeat of God. Jesus left the portals of glory for that reason, that reason alone. Friend, I'm telling you something. I'm not attempting to pit one ministry against another ministry. For those of you that have prophetic ministries within the church or, or maybe, amen, you're leading up or heading up the prayer team or, or maybe you're an intercessor there in the church or, or maybe you're on the platform and you're playing the instruments. Uh, there could be a, a hundred different ministries within a church. And I'm not trying to pit one ministry against another ministry, but I am telling you without any debate, without comparing apples to oranges, amen, that, 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 that evangelism is the most crucial and necessary ministry within any church at this time, hands down. It's going to take that to become essential again. As long as we remain non-essential, what good is prophecy? What good is music? What good is instruments? What good is heading up this ministry and heading up that ministry if we don't affect the community that God has placed us in the midst of? The reality of it all is, is that we're called to be a city set on a hill. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light, meaning that we are the primary purpose of the body of Christ. The primary purpose of it is not that we come together on Sunday and huddle, and Sunday night and huddle, and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday through a revival and huddle, because the truth is for years now we've been huddling but we ain't been scoring. We're not moving the ball as we should. So therefore is why the bleachers are empty and we're considered non-essential. Friend, listen to me. Because there's not one single ministry within the church that's not needed. There's not a ministry, prophecy, intercessory, uh, uh, leading up a prayer team, uh, leading up a Bible study, all these instrument players, the, the offices, administrative offices, uh, all of these ministries are needed. Sunday school, VBS, all of these things are crucial and they are necessary. 
What I'm saying is that winning the lost has always been God's number one priority above anything else. But I can't truly say it has been the church's. And that's what's brought us to becoming non-essential. The Son of God didn't leave the portals of glory to come to earth to start a worship team. He didn't leave the portals of glory to come to earth to unveil hidden prophecy. He didn't leave the portals of glory to come to earth to cradle his bride. The Son of God left the portals of glory for one single primary reason biblically, and that was to seek and save those that are lost, period. When the church stops seeing people born again, primarily on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, I will guarantee you that church will die. I thank God that I'm standing in the middle of a church, amen. There may not be anybody sitting in the seats tonight, but rest assured, sweetheart, Witness Outreach Ministry is not dead. There's life in this ministry, and I thank God that I'm part of a church that is alive and is well. But I can assure each one of you watching tonight, as well as the pastor sitting right there in front of me, that the day that this church takes its attention off of the heartbeat of God, Father's heart, Father's house, and Father's business, and, and they take evangelism and, and the burden for souls and cast it out the back door in exchange for something else, I will assure you, this ministry will die. It's happened. It has happened, friend. It has happened to every church, every denomination, every movement, and every revival in history without any exceptions. When God's people refuse to evangelize and reach out in a personal way, one-on-one, -on -one, when they cease to be productive, and when they cease to be productive, history has proven they spiritually die. If our ministry here if your ministry there is doing this good without personal evangelism, what could it be doing with it? Think about that. If your church is busting at the seams, man, it's growing and it's, it's exciting. Man, you've got something for the kids and something for the youth and something for the, for the older generation. You've got everything to offer, amen, and I'm telling you, you're doing awesome. If your church is doing fantastic without evangelism, what could it be doing with it. The truth is, amen, in 2019, over one-third of the 12,000 Assembly of God churches in America, which is the largest full gospel denomination, reported that they had no conversions for that entire year. And that is a shame, and I'll tell you why that is a shame. 4,000 churches, that would be a third of the 12,000 Assembly of God churches. A third of that would be 4,000, 4, 8, 12. 4,000 churches multiplied by 52 weekly sermons. That's just one sermon a week, Sunday morning only. We'll just count that alone. That comes out to 208,000 sermons preached in 2019 with absolutely no converts. That's bad, brother. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, estimates that only 2% of Christians witness faithfully. Now, I believe I can do this within the security of where you're sitting at right now, and I want to kind of pull you into this so that you feel included rather than secluded from what's being preached right now. Let me ask you a question, my friend. How many souls have you won in the last 12 months? You prayed them through, you want them to God, and they're in church serving Jesus today. Not you invited somebody to church. They showed up. Pastor preached his guts out. The altar song was perfection. And they responded with 15 people around them. And somebody prayed them. No, 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 no. I'm talking about laundromats. I'm talking about theaters, post offices. I'm talking about on the assembly line, your lunch hour. I'm talking about at the academy sporting goods. I'm talking about at Walmart, amen. I'm talking about at Goodies, amen. I'm talking about, listen to me, outside the church, your neighbor. You prayed them through, you want them to God, and they're serving him today. How many of you have led one soul to Jesus Christ in the last 12 months? It's a very sobering question. Even more sobering is the answer. I've been asking that question now for the last several years. And you do good out of a congregation of 100 in attendance. 
to get three people to raise their hand out of a hundred people that they're actually doing what they were saved and born again to do and that is to be essential to be relevant to be necessary the truth is Charles Haddon Spurgeon once made this statement I read it last night I'll read it again he said have you no wish for others to be saved then you're not saved yourself be sure of that the Institute of American Church Growth the IACG found that at least 75% of all new believers come to Christ because of a friend or an acquaintance witnessing to them who took the time to explain the gospel on one-on-one basis. They also found that less than 20% of all conversions comes through events such as Sunday morning church service, crusades, revivals, or even friendship Sundays. Yet the same study finds that churches devote 83% of their time, their money, their efforts, and their resources on these kinds of events. On the very same events that only produces 20% of the conversions. Listen, time and experience has proven through study after study that personal evangelism is by far the single most effective means of reaching the lost. Though they may be necessary, I can tell you it's not church events on any level, and that's coming out of the mouth of a revivalist. I guess I'm trying to work myself out of a job, right? Well, any good leader does. I would love to not have to evangelize and go and revival churches and preach revivals in churches because the churches are doing what they should do. It's time that we start producing what the book of Acts was written in, guys. And I'm not talking just about tongue talking and prophecy and Pentecost. I'm talking about, amen, the very first message that Simon Peter ever preached. 3,000 souls were added to the body of Christ. I'm talking about evangelism. I'm talking about, amen, reaching the Lord at any cost I said reaching the lost at any cost thank God amen amen we have a heartbeat again the church is not dead amen I believe that this epi- this pandemic has woke up a sleeping giant but I also believe that it is vital that we understand the importance amen of getting in line getting back in our lanes amen and doing what God created each one of us to do pastors can't do it by themselves Shepherds don't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. Shepherds stand on two legs. Sheep walk on all four. We have a job to do. You have a job to do. I'm in my lane doing mine. My prayer is, is each one of you listening tonight will be burdened in your heart to say, you know what? Man, I want to taste and see what it's like to lead somebody to Jesus. I can tell you something, friend. It's one of the most amazing things I've ever experienced in my life. As I said yesterday, the greatest gift I could ever give God is my soul. The second greatest gift I could ever give God is somebody else's soul. Just the other day, I pulled up to a Dollar General there, and I went in and purchased some items, and I came back out, and I sat in the truck, and I said, God, I'm open for business. I want you to get used to that. Get used to that. I'm open for business. And, and being that everything's locked up and locked down right now, I think the busiest place in this little city that I'm in right now is the Dollar General, right in the parking lot of the city. So I tell you what, God, I want you to just lead my heart and guide my heart to somebody that I could just witness to and evangelize today. And I'm not leaving this parking lot until you give me the opportunity. Now you got his attention. So as I sit there in the parking lot, I backed up. I'm watching everybody go in and out the door and, and, and I just don't feel any leadership in that direction. And, and uh, I'm just kind of watching and watching and watching, really no leadership at all. And, and out of my peripheral vision, my rearview mirror, I see something moving. I looked up in the rearview mirror of my truck, and I see a hitchhiker walking down the road very slowly with a backpack on his back. <laughs> man, I'm going to tell you something. I turned that truck around, and I locked in on that guy. Amen. And I can tell you, it, it, it's a bad thing when I lock in on you because I'm like a pit bull, amen. I don't get off too easy. 
And I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. He walks down the highway there, and he comes to this four-way stop, this little city, and he crosses right on across. I truly expected him to take a turn into one of those convenience stores, the kangaroo, the marathon, amen, the ideal. But he didn't. He walked right on through the intersection. And, and then I realized, man, this dude is on his way to the next city, which is about 15 miles down the road. I thought to myself, hey, I got an idea. It always works when it comes to evangelism. I'll sneak up behind him, toot my horn, get him in the truck. I'll lock the doors and get up to about 75, and he ain't going nowhere. And it worked again. Now, I'm not encouraging go out and start picking up hitchhikers, especially for you ladies, but it worked for me. So I pulled up there behind him and tooted my horn. He turned around and looked, and I motioned for him to come back to the truck. And I said, hey, man, I said, uh, is, is there any way I could help you? He said, well, yeah, man, I, I, I appreciate a ride. I said, man, jump in. I, I got all day. I said, hop in. I said, where are you headed? You headed down to Crofton, Kentucky? He said, yeah. I said, man, that's about 15 miles, ain't it? He said, man, yeah, my legs are wore out. I said, looks like you've been coming from Madisonville. He said, yeah. He said, I've probably put in about 20 miles already. And I said, well, man, just shut in and lock, shut the door and put your seatbelt on. And, and uh, I said, I'm going to give you a ride. And so we took off down the road there. And as we going down the road, I, I struck up a conversation with him. And he wanted to know who I was. I told him who I was. And then I, then I took the lead. And here's what I did. I said, hey, man, I said, let me tell you why I picked you up. Number one, I didn't pick you up because I feel sorry for you. I didn't pick you up because, hey, man, that I, it, it bothered me that you were walking down the road. I picked you up because I asked God to give me an opportunity probably about 25 minutes ago to minister to somebody and evangelize. And I told God I was open for business. And no sooner than I said those words, you come walking down the road. He's just looking at me like a deer in front of headlights. And uh, I sped on up there and I looked over at him. and I told him, I said, are you from this area? And he said, yeah, yeah, I really am. I said, well, I said, I've been preaching right up here at this church called The River here in Nortonville. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah, I've been, been preaching up there a little bit lately. And he says, hey, man, I, I know a guy that goes to that church up there. I said, who is that? He said, well, it's a, it's, it's a guy I used to be in jail with, and his name is Adam Young. I said, Adam Young? He said, yeah, man. He said, you know Adam? I said, man, do I know Adam? I said, the truth is I know Adam better than you know Adam. He said, well, what do you know about him? I said, man, the last time you saw Adam, you're sitting in a jail cell with him. Hey, man, smoking crack cocaine. I said, but Adam is a pastor now, and he pastors one of our sister churches down in Katy, East Kentucky. And I said, man, you wouldn't even know Adam if you seen him right now. I said, he's still a big old bear, man. I said, but I said, but he loved, love with Jesus, and he's pastoring that church. God's put his family back together. He's got his driver's license back. He's even got a pistol permit, man. I mean, God has really, really you know, structured this guy back. And, man, this dude just looked down at the floorboard with a blank look on his face. I looked over at him, and I said, you almost look like you would wish God would do something like that for you. And he looked over at me, and he said, man, yeah, I need God to do something like that for me. He said, but i just been so stubborn, man, and I won't listen. He said, here I'm walking down the side of the road. He said, a matter of fact, I just told God a while ago, how did I end up here? And I could almost swear that God said that I was in a cage of my own creation. And I said, well, I would have to agree. You probably are. I said, because the Bible says if you're willing and obedient, you eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you get devoured. I said, man, won't you let me pray for you? That would be a great place to start. He said, man, he said, I really would want you to pray for me. He said, can you just pull the truck over here and me and just, just, just kind of lock, lock hands here? and Can you just help me find my way back home? Guys, I'm talking about a hitchhiker. I'm talking about walking out of Dollar General and telling God, Lord, you know what? I need an opportunity, and I ain't leaving this parking lot because I'm open for business. And now here I am. My God, I'm getting happy. Here I am sitting on the side of the road with a guy I just met seven minutes ago, and he's asking me now to pull the truck over, lock hands with him, and help him find his way home. I did prayed him through, won him to God. The guy was eight inches of snot pouring out his face by the time we got through. You say that's sick. No, 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 no. That is beautiful. It's precious. 
See a grown man with a backpack on his back, a burly beard, broke down, disgusted, frustrated, with eight inches of snot pouring out his face because he's hungry for hope. He's looking diligently for peace of mind. I got to lead that guy to God. I'm telling you something, folks. The Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to lean in on this for a second. That means I really want you to remove all distractions from you and listen to what's fixing to fall off my lips. Isn't it ironic that the first part of God is go? The first part of gospel is go. The first part of good news is go. But if you take go out of good news, then it becomes odd news okay let me break that G-O-O-D news good news you take go out of G-O-O-D you're left with O-D news good news becomes odd news when you take out the go isn't it ironic that our news has become odd news to the point that we're now non essential it's not good to the community, good to the state, not even good for the country anymore. People would rather just have a liter of vodka or the morning after pill. It should convict you, friend, and bother you as it has me. Doesn't it seem odd that the church that supposedly has the good news of the gospel of God doesn't go telling it? I also find that ironic. Not only is the first part of God go, the first part of gospel go, the first part of good news go, but isn't it ironic to me that the first part of Satan is set? I got to be careful doing this. I look like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and I can assure you that there is no affiliation. <laughs> Not even remotely. I'm afraid that your church has sat so long in our buildings that the seats are starting to stink. Maybe that's why the seats are called pews. We sat so long in our seats that they stink. I'm declaring that it's time to get off of our blessed assurance and go to a hurting world because we are sinning if we keep sitting when we're told to be going. Let me say that again. We are sinning if we keep sitting when we're told to be going. A lot of believers think that just praying for the lost is sufficient and that there's nothing more they need to do. They just turn it over to God and trust Him to answer their prayer. But that concept is wrong and rarely, if ever, produces any fruit. That's exactly what I said. I said, we just come to the altar and we pray, just turn it over to God, just expect God to take care of everything in life. There's some things, amen, we need God to take care of, but there's a lot of things that God needs you and me to take care of. The church needs to pray. The church needs to pray harder. Church needs to pray longer. Church needs to pray more fervently. Yet praying is not a substitute for going into the world with the gospel. There is no such thing in your Bible called prayer evangelism. Not there. No such thing. It's fine to pray for the lost, but that alone will never get a single lost person saved. Just praying for them only. I know this is messing with some of your thinking right now, uh, and I'm glad that it is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching a false doctrine. You're just not listening to me. Because what I'm preaching right now is called reverse psychology and it's messing up stinking thinking that the church has been so long inundated with and then we wonder why it's not producing any fruit. I'm telling you why it's not producing any fruit because just praying for the lost will never get a single lost person saved. You didn't get saved just because somebody prayed for you. No, somebody had to come get you. 
Somebody had to come minister to you. You had to hear a preacher. Somebody gave you a track. Somebody, amen, led you in a sinner's prayer. Somebody else God used. So it takes more than just praying for the lost. We got to go get the lost. The truth is, amen, it's not wrong to pray for the lost, but it is wrong if all we do is just pray for the lost. Yes, we need to pray. Matter of fact, we have something very scriptural to pray about. Jesus told us all to pray about this one issue when it comes to the lost. Pray that the Lord would send forth the laborers. Yes, sir. Church, I'm not in the least knocking what goes on around these altars or in the prayer room, amen, on any level. Please do not misunderstand me. I'm only trying my best to convey to each of you the importance of personal evangelism, and I'm trying to convey that somewhere between our traditional way of thinking versus what the Bible actually teaches us. I'm walking a tightrope. I know that I am, but still it must be done. Praying is not a substitute for going. Nowhere does God's Word teach us to get together in the prayer room or around the altars and ask God to bring in the lost so that they might encounter His presence. Let me say that again because I know some of you are shaking your head. Your eyes are dilating. Amen. They're bloodshot. You got foam running out both lips. Come on. Amen. I know. Amen. That that thing is manifesting right now. You can't believe I just said what I said, but I'm going to say it again so that I can clarify. Nowhere does God's Word out of 66 books Uh, amen, including the New Testament, teach any of us uh, to get together in prayer rooms or around the altar and ask God to bring in the law so that they might encounter his presence. He never once told us to do that. Uh, But almost every church and its members, in my experience, is doing just that uh, and then wonder why we're considered non-essential. He told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Some Christians believe that their mission in prayer is to get the Holy Spirit to do what he told us to do. You think about that. We don't send the Holy Ghost. We don't send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sends us. That's so true. Even when it comes to our singing, our worship, and our praise. Is it possible to come into our churches and sing about someone we claim to love with all of our hearts, yet we rarely talk about him outside the sanctuary, thereby disobeying the very one we claim to love so much, and then wonder why we're considered non-essential? And the liquor store is. I know I keep repeating that, but I'm going to keep on repeating that because therein lies the root of the problem. Should we sing? Yes, we should sing. We didn't sing tonight because you didn't want me to. <laughs> yeah, because I could come off with me. And that wouldn't do any of you any good right there, amen. We'd go from 616 views to four. Come on, amen. Hello. So our singers are not here tonight. We're literally social distancing, amen, 20-mile minimum. Nonetheless, amen, I'm here to preach. I'm not here to sing, but we should sing. Jesus has put a song in our hearts. We've got something to sing about. He's the one who deserves our praise. That's who the birds are singing about. That's who the trees raise their arms to. Yes, we certainly should be singing. But singing is not a substitute for going. Jesus commanded us to go, not sing. Not everybody has the talent to sing. But everybody can go somewhere and tell somebody about salvation in Jesus Christ. Everybody can go somewhere and tell somebody what a change Jesus Christ made in their life. However, there are Christians who think if they sing a special in church or sing and play on the praise team or their feet ever touches the platform that they somehow don't need to go. They've done their part. They've done their duty. Job well done. They clock out when they get in the car. But singing in church is not the same as going into the world with the gospel. The problem with thinking 
this concept to be enough is that we all find ourselves week after week singing to saved ones when we're really ignoring lost ones. We find ourselves singing to saved ones when we are told to be going to lost ones. On, on another note, allow me, if you will, to unveil something to you tonight that I believe is one of the biggest misconceptions in the church today concerning evangelism. Listen very closely to this. Inviting people to church is evangelism. Wrong. Now, please understand what I'm fixing to say. I am not picking or criticizing prayer. I am not criticizing singing. And I'm not criticizing inviting people to church. I'm simply saying evangelism is an entity of itself. And you cannot mix it with all the other activities that we perceive to be a form of evangelism. That's what's got us in the mess we're in right now. There's prayer, there's singing, there's inviting, there's giving, but, but then there's evangelism which sits as an entity of itself. Listen to me, friend. Ask any average Christian at any church on any given day if they've ever witnessed for Christ. And 95% will probably say something like this to you. Yes, sir, Brother Couch, I have. I, a matter of fact, Brother, uh, I invited my co-workers last Thursday to church for several weeks now, and I'm not giving up. That's what the answer you get. That's what they all say. You ask them if they've ever, you know, have they ever been effective in evangelism, a witness for Christ, and they want to literally jump to invitation. Listen to the average pastor remind you to be sure to invite your friends and your loved ones to church next week. I'm afraid that we have mistaken evangelism and church growth. So allow me to explain the difference. Inviting someone to come to church is church growth. Inviting someone to Christ is evangelism. Inviting someone to church is fine, but that only continues the wrong concept. Here's the wrong concept. Well, if we invite them to church, then they will become a Christian. And that concept is a lot of the time wrong. Watch. That concept has allowed too many to fall into the flames of hell as it is, and that concept needs to stop. That if I can just invite people to come to church, if they just get to church, they'll become a Christian. That's not true. Our churches in this nation is absolutely full of lost folks who come every week and think themselves to be saved based on nothing more than affiliation with the church itself. So the concept's wrong. It's horribly wrong. That if we can just get them here, they'll become a Christian. If that be true, then, then why is the church full of lost folks? Many of them in leadership positions. Some of them deacons and elders. Some of them musicians on a platform singing about a mountaintop. They ain't even living on themselves. It's truth. I see it every week in revival. It's a beautiful thing to see them finally have an encounter with God or, or, a, or a leader or a deacon or an elder or a sound technician or, or the guy that drives the van, finally have a fresh encounter with God. That's so encouraging to me, friend. But I'm talking about the concept needs to change. They go to church on Sunday morning and feel automatically qualified to call themselves Christians, yet have never truly asked forgiveness of their sins and embraced Christianity as a way of life. They are still the same person They've always been. Only difference is they now go to church, and that's all they do. Sinners need Jesus, not a building. That's right. Today's misconception is get people to church and then to Christ. It's wrong, it's wrong on all levels. I know some of you want to argue with me right now, and you, you've got your commentary open. You've got your Matthew Henry, your James Fawcett and Brown, your Jimmy Swear. You've got all your commentaries open, amen, and you're Googling up a storm right now, amen, and you're going to do your best to prove me wrong tonight, friend. Good luck. You're not going to do it. 
You, you, you can't argue this. This is where we are today. This is the reason why we're not essential. Because we've got too many misconceptions in the church, corporately speaking, that God's not pleased with, nor does it bear effective fruit. Today's misconception is get people to church and then to Christ. That system is fine for those who will go to church. But what about the other 90% of those in your community and nearby cities who will never go to church, regardless of the attraction of our church building? What are we going to do about that? Besides, it's hard enough trying to get believers to come to church on Sunday night, Wednesday night, and weekly revival services, much less the unbelievers. Some folks believe the best way to evangelism is just sit in church and learn. So they go to every class possible, every session possible, and spend thousands of dollars attending colleges, pursuing head knowledge, thinking that somehow know-how is sufficient. But it's not know-how that the world is looking for. I'm here to tell you, friend, God can do much more with an unlearned, biblically ignorant, witnessing Christian who is in love with Jesus and in love with lost souls than he could ever do in a thousand years with an educated professor that never even tries. It is right, brother. That is so right. Billy Graham, the great evangelist, once made this statement. The sad fact of the matter is that some of our greatest Bible scholars is without a doubt our poor soul winners, end of quote. Few educated professionals in their glass cathedrals and their purple robes and their have ever been able to witness with the success of an ordinary Jesus-loving, concerned Christian. The world does not want the wisdom of a religious professional the world wants to know about Jesus Christ in the simplest terms possible. Just be real and practical. As I land this plane tonight, listen closely. The Bible says not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish. The next time you wonder if God could really use you to make a real difference, just remember Isaiah had unclean lips and Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old and Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar and Leah was ugly. Oh, yes, she was. Joseph was abused and Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid and Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist looked like like a camel, ate bugs, and had honey stuck in the corner of his beard. Uh, amen. Peter denied Christ. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene, demon possessed. A woman at the well divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer, and Lazarus was dead. What's your reason for not evangelizing? I didn't think you had one. If God can use these people, he can use you, my friend. Once the priority of this church and your church, my friend, is placed back on soul winning and personal evangelism, which is Father's heart, Father's house, and Father's business, then I personally believe we will each discover a depth, a real depth in Christ, never experienced by what I call the spiritual recluse which is simply those who remain continually stuck inside the four walls of the sanctuary or continually stuck in their self-made comfort zones, spending their whole life playing it safe. All they do is show up, they sit, they soak, they sire, and wait for an opportunity to soul. But they know nothing about being about the Father's business. The world really isn't interested, nor does it care about the truths from religious commentators and elite pastors who shoot 10 miles over everybody's head. They don't need deep revelation about the end times, friend. There is a place, there is a time for Bible prophecy. There's a place, there is a time, amen, for that. I get that. But I'm not talking about Christians that are in church trying to gain wisdom and insight and biblical knowledge. I'm talking about the lost. Drug addict and alcoholic don't need prophecy that's 15 miles over his crackhead. 
What he needs is simply to hear and feel and see the simplicity of Christ by those of us who have 20-20 vision and a heart for personal evangelism. So in closing tonight, I set this up for a grand finale. I hope this is a blessing to you and a challenge to you in the same breath. What are we going to do with the command of Jesus to go? He told a leprous man to go show himself to the priest. He went and was healed. He told a centurion to go back to his servant. He went and his servant was healed. He told the legion of demons to go and they went out of the man. He told the man from whom he had cast demons out to go into his hometown and tell them about the miracle. He went and proclaimed his deliverance. He told 12 disciples to go throughout Israel and preach. They went and delivered the message. He told the disciples of John the Baptist, go and give John a message. They went and did what they were told. He told Peter, go to the sea and catch a fish. He went, received a miracle, paid his taxes. He healed a paralyzed man, told him to get up and go. And he went and took his cot with him. He told his disciples, get into a boat and go to the other side of the sea. They went unto the other side as he commanded. He told a blind man, go, wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam. And he went and was healed. He told 70 disciples, go into the towns and villages and groups by two. Amen. And preach the good news. They went and many were set free. He told a man who was sick with a sick child to go. He went back and his child was healed. He told two of his disciples, go get a donkey for him to ride into Jerusalem. They went and Jesus rode their own. He told some of his disciples, Go, prepare for the Passover. They went and did what they were told. After the resurrection, he told Mary Magdalene, Go, tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee. They went and so he did. So if he tells demons to go and they go, if he tells sickness to go and it goes, if he tells a blind, amen, amen, and the sick to go and they go, and if he told the early Christians go and they go, why is it that when he tells followers today go, we sit? Why is it that demons in hell are more obedient than followers of Jesus? You do the math, my friend. What does that produce when he tells us to go and we don't? Liquor stores and abortion clinics far more essential than the army of God. Wow, man. How are you going to argue with this? This ain't a Baptist doctrine. This ain't a Pentecostal thing. This ain't a denominational message. This is the Word of God. And it is so relative for the moment we are living in right now. Going Christians are most definitely growing Christians. I'll say that again. Going Christians are without a doubt growing Christians. How is it possible to grow if we sit down and refuse to go. The Bible says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. That you should what? Go. And bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Friend, I want to thank you for the opportunity to pour my heart out to you tonight. You can see now why I said that we don't need a song as an introductory for something like this. This is just, this cuts to the heart. This is the heart of God, man. This may not be the heart of denomination. This may not be the heart of your pastor. But this is truly the heart of God. And I believe a thousand mile journey begins with the first step. And I also believe that when you find yourself in a hole, Quit digging. And if we're not awake and understanding that the church has found itself in a hole, a pit, if you want to be honest, it's time to stop digging it any deeper. We don't have time for all these programs that just comforts the body. We don't have time for pulpit puppets or what I call pulpit pimps who have done nothing but prostitute the gospel for nobody's gain but themselves. What we do have time for is evangelism. That is the message from the heart of God for His bride, His church, and His body for this hour. I want to close out tonight with a prayer. 
If you're watching tonight and you're lost without Jesus, you don't know him as your personal Savior. Those of us here at Witness Outreach Ministries have a bleeding heart for you. We didn't turn these lights on tonight to get an offering. We ain't passed no offering plates. They've been laying right where they've been, amen, since I got here Sunday morning. We're not interested in your money. What we are interested in is your soul. I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and if you've tuned in tonight and you're lost without Jesus and you don't know him as your Savior, I would trust tonight at the conclusion of this service, therefore we're on right now, that you would just pray this prayer with me. Pull your heart out to God and say, God, help me to be what you created me to be. Help me to find not only my lane in life, but my purpose for existence. I believe you'll do that right now. You wake up tomorrow morning, hear the birds sing for the first time in a long time. You've got a choice to make. Not only do you have a choice to make, sinner man, but sir, ma'am, those of you that attend church faithfully, but you put all your eggs in the basket of prayer and invitation and singing and giving, I mean, you're not going to go nowhere. You'll be glad to write somebody a check and send them, but there ain't nothing on your mind about going. It needs to change, friend needs to change. God wants to use you. What a tragedy to live your whole life sitting in church and never lead one soul to Jesus Christ. All you got to do is back up. Put the truck in park. Say, God, I'm open for business. Use me, God. That's all evangelism is. Open to opportunity and then having the courage to walk through the door. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you that it's been anointed since I opened up my mouth, God. This has been so refreshing to me. I've got a little over an hour's drive back home tonight, God, and I'm just going to drive and just be excited tonight. So worth my time coming over here. God, I thank you tonight, God, that you have spoken to somebody in that camera. You have spoken to somebody that tuned in and it wasn't by coincidence and it wasn't by luck and chance that they just so happened to just drop in tonight, God. They didn't just drop in. Their feet, their fingers, their eyes, their ears were directed in this direction. I want to thank you tonight for their obedience. And I pray, God, Lord, that you'd speak to somebody's life to encourage them and strengthen them and help them find themselves to be effective in the area and arena of evangelism right now in the hour we're living in. For that one that's watching that's lost without you tonight, God, help them to simply say, Lord, save my soul. Forgive me of my sins and wrongdoings. Forgive me for just being brain dead and doing my own thing despite what I know is right. Forgive me, God, for making all the excuses that have ended me up like that hitchhiker just basically in a cage of my own creation. Father, I pray tonight, God, Lord, as they repent and call out to you tonight, Lord, that as you wash them with the blood of Jesus and cleanse their soul, spirit, mind, conscience, and their heart, I pray not to be the night that they sleep better and they've slept in a long time, wake up tomorrow, energized and ready to to be open for business looking for an opportunity and through you finding the courage to step through the door I give you the glory and I give you the praise tonight in Jesus name amen hey if you prayed that prayer with us tonight if you would drop us a little note there you ain't got to be a paragraph just drop us a little note there and let us know amen that the service tonight was a blessing to you and that you benefited from it Um, I tell you I, I I I I love those comments more than Jimmy Carter loved his jelly beans. Come on, I'm telling you right now. Amen. I want you to just just put those, even if you didn't like anything I said tonight and you'd like to just let me have both barrels and add one, go ahead and get it out of your system. My skin's thick and I can take it. However, I'm not here to argue. I'm not here for a debate. I'm not here to prove you wrong and me right. Not that kind of person. I'm not interested in that, friend. Uh, My mindset has always been that, you know, Just because you don't agree with me, that doesn't make me wrong. (laughs) So I'll just take that. 
back to the house with me tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Please tune in. Tell somebody about what's going on. I mean, you can't watch sports right now. You got all those distractions removed from you. What a better place to be than tuning in right here. Witness Outreach Ministries right on the outskirts of Russellville, Alabama. Amen. With Pastor Brian Scott, 6 p.m. tomorrow night. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Amen. Good night.